welcome to the course Introduction to the Psychology of Language. I am Dr. Arkwanma from IIT Kanpur and this is the third week of the course. In this week, we are going to talk about the process of speech production and comprehension. During the course of the lectures in this week, I will talk to you about issues that come up while you want to go from an idea to communicating about that idea uh, in a perfectly grammatically correct, not uh, making so many errors and so on and so forth. We will try and understand this process. We will try and see, say for example, once you have an idea, how do you put that idea from a uh, completely metaphysical thought space to something that you actually uh, speak out and speech is basically a physical process. So you are actually moving your uh, speech muscles, you are mo moving your vocal tracts and you are finally creating some physical energy to go on with the speech sound. That is going to be the first uh, part of this week. And the second part is also once you said something, how does the other person understand it? Say for example, we will also talk about the processes that are involved in comprehension slash understanding of speech. See, once something is said in the world, the physical energy that you've created, it travels outwards, but you also hear what you say. What really happens when somebody else or you yourself are hearing some uh, aspect of speech? How do you understand speech? What are the processes that are required in perception and comprehension of speech? So this is going to be the outline for uh, this week. We are going to talk about speech production and speech comprehension. Now coming to the first few lectures. The first three lectures of this week will basically be concerned more with speech production and aspects of speech production. We will basically be covering at least two models. One is the Weaver++ model and the other is the Dell's spreading activation model. We will talk about some uh, related phenomena of speech using those models. And the second uh, part of the uh, week basically in uh, that is lectures 4 and 5 will mostly be about perception and comprehension of speech and the issues that come up there will. So let's not waste a lot of time and go to uh, understanding about speech production. So today's lecture is basically a speech production first. Uh, let's try and talk about what basically speech is about. Now I'm sure you would know that majority of human communication when it comes to language is basically happening via speech. For the most part, you're speaking to each other. Obviously, we communicate via writing as well, via sending messages, via drawing, uh, via so many things. But if you really uh, look at it by, via sign language and so on and so forth, but if you really look at it, the majority of communication that we actually do is via speech. We speak to each other by moving the vocal apparatus and the other person kind of hears us by using the comprehension apparatus and kind of once he or she understands the message, he acts upon it, okay, or maybe replies uh, back to us in some way. So speech is certainly a very important aspect as far as language is concerned. Let's try and look at what speech kind of uh, is. So speech basically includes a range of steps from conceptualizing an idea uh, that the speaker wishes to uh, convey and uh, then what happens is that once you uh, have thought of okay now I want to speak about let us say I want to speak about a vacation that I had some time back okay so then what do you do is you uh, uh, conceptualize that idea and then you produce a set of behaviors which is basically that you select some words and then you finally move your jaws and move your lips and your tongue to create some kind of signal that is the speech signal that you set out in the open. This acoustic signal that you have created is now available for the other listeners to listen and to comprehend and to act upon. So this is basically the act of speech uh, production. The listener then basically what he or she does is it analyzes the acoustic signal. It's a physical uh, form of energy, the uh, acoustic signal and basically it works on the acoustic signal to decipher the words uh, and that and to kind of uh, uh, understand what each of those words mean and uh, matches those words to the particular concepts and uh, which the person would already have stored in mind and then basically that leads to the understanding of what has been said. So basically these two are sort of a loop sort of a process. One you have an idea and then you produce some sort of speech and the other is you have some speech and you have to go to that idea. So this is basically the closed loop of communication which is achieved via speech. So. Uh, let us see, uh, how is uh, speech produced? So to understand how speech is produced, we basically have to break down the process in, into a few sub-processes and we will see how that is basically achieved. One of the first things is if there has to be a theory of speech production or speech comprehension so to speak, it should describe first 
the mental representations that support the translation between ideas and from those ideas to actually creating a particular set of instructions for the body to be able to move your tongue in exactly that way. Say for example, if I have to talk about my pet dog, I should have a picture of what a dog is or say what I should know something about my dog to the point that I can actually create the words D-O-G in a particular sequence that you hear dog coming out of my mouth. So how does this happen? I had basically just an abstract idea about what a dog is and from that idea I have to come to a point where I can kind of move my vocal apparatus to actually create the sound that will represent those concepts. Now speech in that sense is a physical act and it's a complicated physical act because it exquisitely requires you to, to have a very tight control over more than 100 muscles in this vocal apparatus. So this is something which is a very sophisticated mental activity or rather say it's a very uh, sophisticated motor activity that uh, the motor area of your brain uh, really gets involved in uh, achieving. So this is in that sense uh, something that is uh, slightly difficult and we have to try and understand it. Uh, how do we really get to the understanding? Let's ask some of the basic questions that could be interesting and are important for us to understand speech comprehension. Now, one of the first questions is what steps need to be taken to retrieve the linguistic representations uh, one uh, needs to convey the idea. So, I can have an idea about so many things in life. Say for example, a lot of times you'll see people sometimes say that I do not have the words to convey this feeling. Okay, but then the communication will not happen. So you need to have words to convey whatever feeling you have. And what we do is sometimes we kind of find it a bit hard, sometimes we find it a bit easier. But you have to reach that space uh, in order to dig for those words that represent those meanings. Simpler concepts, that's all right. This could be, this is a stylus, there is a chair, there is a camera, there is uh, some lights over there. So these are some of the concepts. As soon as I look at the concepts, I gather the words that I have to speak. So what is it in my head that is helping me reach that precise word, let us say light or a precise word, let us say chair, when I see this chair right in front of me. So this is what is it in my head that is helping me connect the idea to the exact word that represents those ideas. So that is one very important question and we will kind of come to that. Now, once you have those representations, how do you arrange them in a way uh, that you have a particular sentence to speak? You can have a thought about, say for example, anything that you would want to talk about. Uh, suppose you want to have a very uh, simple weather conversation with somebody. So you are, let us say, waiting at some place and there is this uh, other traveler that comes and you just want to look at the weather and say, okay, what a nice weather. You know, it's a bit cold today, it's a bit chilly, it's not typical for this time of the year, something like that. How do you organize those representations that they are syntactically coming out correctly and in a very intelligible way so that the other person can also listen to it and respond back? What are the processes that are kind of helping us do this? Also, how are those representations translated into a form? Now, even you can have words, even you can come to the point that you have this sentence is what I am going to speak. Suppose I am reading out from some place. If I'm reading out from some place, the initial part maybe I can skip a little bit. That I cannot, when we talk about reading, we'll come to that. But let us say I don't really have to do the first part of what this process is, but I just have to read. If I just have to read even, uh, I have to kind of uh, get to a point where I know the exact instructions that I have to give to my vocal tract muscles. And this vocal tract includes a few things. I can tell you, uh, these vocal tract muscles and basically arrive at a point where I say that okay, these physical gestures will create the exact same message that I intend to convey. Okay? Some of these questions will be something that we will be talking about partly in today's lecture as well and in the coming lectures of this chapter. Now, let us kind of move a little bit further. Let us try and for giving this discussion a little bit of shape, let us uh, try and look at a particular model. I'm going to talk to you about uh, Weaver++, which is uh, William, William Levitt's model of speech production. I'm kind of discussing it uh, from the book uh, that uh, I'm using for this course, that is Traxler's uh, Introduction to Psycholinguistics. Now, uh, one of the things, if you look at that particular model, uh, is that you have to do at least a few things in order to start speaking. What are the three things? Suppose I give you a task, you know, I ask you to pause the video a little bit and I ask you to basically, you know, imagine how you're going to uh, describe something to me or say for example, you know, how do I ask you to, uh, let us say if I ask you to write uh, or say for example, recite a little bit of an essay 
on your favorite sport or your favorite animal or your favorite food or whatever, you know, your favorite place to visit. How will you uh, achieve this task? Now, there is a guess. Uh, you could probably, even as a first process, you could be conceptualizing what is it that I want to talk about? What are the experiences? What are, what are the all what are all the abstract ideas that I want to convey when I want to convey about, let us say, my favorite place to visit or my favorite food or whatever? So this first part is called conceptualization. Basically, it is about thinking of what to say. What do I want to put in my message? The content of the message is basically going to get captured in conceptualization. The second part is formulation. Once I have the content of the message all right, I have to figure out in my language words and structures that will be able to convey this message faithfully. So the second part is basically figuring out a good way to express the idea. Exactly how I am going to put this. I am angry with somebody and I want to kind of convey my anger at some point. Uh, how do I do it? Do I go and shout in a particular way? Do I kind of try and say it politely but I still make sure that the message is conveyed? Do I put a sarcastic comment? What do I do? Okay, so I have to figure out exactly how this message is going to be conveyed. That is basically referred to as formulation. Now, once I've formulated the message, I've already say, for example, in formulation, I already included putting the words in together and, you know, putting the syntax structure all right. All of that I've already, uh, let us say, factored in. So then what remains? The remaining part is basically the part that is called articulation. Now I have to move my speech muscles in such a way that the person exactly hears what I intend him to hear. Okay, so I conceptualize what I wanted to say, the message, I put that message into a particular formulation that this is what the person is going to hear and then I put this formulation into the speech program such in such a way that out of my mouth comes only that message that I had initially conceptualized. Now this is, yeah, this sort of probably seems simple at this moment but it carries so many steps and it kind of carries a, re a really uh, sophisticated process. Uh, and this is that process that we are going to talk about in today's lecture. One of the models, as I was saying, that attempts to kind of help us understand this entire process is William Level's model uh, called, uh, you know, William Le Level's uh, Weaver++ plus plus model. Let us look at the model now. Now, this is the figure of that model. I've borrowed this uh, from William Level's original paper. And this is how this model looks. Uh, before we kind of go into a lot of detail of this model, I would like you to kind of pause and look at the figure in a little bit of detail, maybe kind of uh, take a screenshot, keep this uh, separately, because when I'm going to talk to you about the details of this model, I would really want you to look at each of these steps and wonder how things are happening. Now, if you look at this step, it starts with conceptual preparation on the top. So, conceptual preparation in terms of lexical concepts. Don't worry about these words, I'll kind of, you know, talk about these words in much more detail when we go ahead. So, the first part you see in the model is conceptual preparation in terms of lexical concepts. The output of that stage is lexical concept, then you get lexical selection. Once you have one or many lexical concepts, that's why, uh, that's how you will do selection. Once you've selected, then you kind of go to the lemma of that concept. I'll talk to you about what lemma is. After that, you will do what is called morphological encoding. After that, you will basically end up with a particular kind of a morpheme. You will go into phonological encoding and syllabification. And then what you'll have in the end is a phonological word form. Once you have the phonological word form, basically you don't need much after this. You basically need a little bit of a phonetic encoding, which is syllabification and stuff. And then you go to a phonetic gestural score, going to articulation. And once you've articulated, you hear the sound wave and you kind of try and comprehend it backwards. So this is basically, you see there's a loop starting from the phonological word form to the sound wave, uh, both of them connecting back to the conceptual preparation stage. Basically, it is sort of a feedback loop which tells us that as soon as you have the phonological words, you're already, you have that, you know, sort of inner speech that you're listening to and responding uh, by making changes in what you have to say. Sometimes that can happen earlier. Sometimes it will happen a little bit later. Sometimes, say for example, you said something and then you've heard, oh, this is something that I was not intending to say. So this would happen at both stages. That's why you see that feedback loop coming from both sides. Okay, so this is basically the figure. I would really like you to, uh, you know, uh, have a look at it, try and remember this as we go into more details of this process today. So in today's lecture, we'll basically discuss this model in, in a little bit more detail. Now, uh, 
Uh, moving further, one of the goals of this model Weaver++ is to describe the intermediate steps between activating an idea and activating the sounds needed to express the idea. So I am going to, uh, the first part is activating the idea which is your conceptual preparation and the second is the activating the sounds. How do you come from idea to sounds? Now, in this model or as William Level kind of probably understands this speech production is viewed as involving a sequence of mental uh, processes. So it's not like you just uh, thought of an idea and you finally articulated it. There, there are so many small small steps, so many mental processes that happen in the middle. What you will talk about is say for example uh, in the model as well in the figure if you look back that each of these boxes are a mental process. So each mental process uh, basically will be able to accomplish a sub goal and the output of one mental process basically provides the information for the second mental process. So if you look at these boxes, I'm again going back to the figure, conceptual preparation, lexical selection, morphological encoding, all of these are basically each of them simple individual mental processes. Each of these mental processes are creating an output uh, basically which is going to be fed as the input for the next stage. So this is basically a sort of a serial uh, you know uh, model. So each box in the figure as we, uh, as we just saw indicates a kind of mental process for example conceptual preparation. It refers to choosing a particular idea that you want to express at the same time ensuring that you have words for those in your language. So you have to kind of do this. Now the output of what? The output of the conceptual preparation which was the first mental process is a lexical concept. What is a lexical concept? A lexical concept basically is an idea for which your language has a label. Suppose you want to talk about something. Uh, if you want to talk about uh, say for example uh, a red colored flower and uh, you know you look at it, uh, you kind of going around and in the garden you kind of come across that red colored flower. Uh, as soon as you look at that red colored flower you understand okay this is a rose. As soon as you look at that flower, you have the word activated, okay, this is a rose. Or you look at an animal, suppose you're looking at a cat for the first time, but you're looking at, say, for example, a species that you've not come across. The closest what you will do is basically you will say, okay, this looks like a cat. Maybe it is cat something. You know, this is how we kind of create sometimes novel words. But more often than not, for a lot of things that you would come across in your daily life, you will have a word for it. That word which represents that concept has basically been referred to as a lexical concept, a concept for which words are there in your language. That is one. So they have taken an example, the example of the concept of a female horse. Now female horse is called a mare, everybody knows it. So as soon as you see a female horse, you will have the word mare. But say for example, if you see a female elephant, a female elephant there is not really a single word for uh, saying a female elephant, at least in English. I know for sure that in Hindi there is. But basically then because you didn't really have a, a single word for expressing female elephant, the idea of a female elephant, you will basically combine two ideas. You will have female and you will have elephant, I will combine them and this set of words becomes the word for that idea. So that is basically sometimes what you will have to do, okay. Now, uh, yeah, exactly this question, but can all ideas be neatly expressed with individual words? Probably not. Uh, if not, then what do you need to do? We need a stage of processing that takes our non-linguistic ideas and finds the lexical or linguistic forms so that we can that we can use to express those ideas. This whole concept of combining female and elephant and conveying that idea of female elephant. Okay, this is basically referred to as the lexicalization process. You know, you have to kind of uh, come up with words uh, for these particular concepts. Okay, so this process of lexicalization basically serves as the interface uh, between the non-language uh, thought processes and the linguistic systems that produce verbal expressions to convey those thoughts. Thoughts you can have about anything, thoughts you can have uh, completely indefinite and infinite and so on and so forth. But eventually because you want to communicate about th those thoughts, you have to come up with words that kind of closely, as closely as possible uh, convey those thoughts, okay. So coming up with words for those particular thoughts is referred to as lexicalization. You have to remember this. Now moving ahead, what does lexicalization include? Again, when your language does have a word for the idea, suppose I, I was giving you an example of a rose, uh, you know, so when your language does have an idea for the word that you wish to convey, uh, then you basically do what? You activate the lexical concept. A lexical concept is an idea that can be expressed in a word and this will basically lead to a scenario where you will need to do what? 
you need to do lexical selection. You can come up with one idea, that's all right, no selection needed, but you probably will come up with one or more kind of words for one kind of concept sometimes. So then you will basically need to do lexical selection. Lexical selection basically is when a language has a number of different words that are close in meaning to the idea that you wish to express. Suppose you want to express your uh, anger, it can range from being mildly disappointed to being annoyed to being slightly angry to being completely enraged about something. Okay. So say for example for this particular idea there are so many of these words and you have to select from these words. So this is basically lexical selection. You have to select from these many words which is the exact word that I want to communicate now. Okay. So uh, one of uh, these lexical concepts have to be selected for production. This process will be called lexical selection and basically it comes up with the lemma as an output. So it basically again lemma is also a little bit of an abstract idea. Lemma is what comes out of lexical selection. Okay. Now what is this lemma about? Lemma basically is this mental representation that reflects the intermediate stage between activating an idea and activating the sounds. See as soon as you finalize this exact word candidate is the one that I want to speak about that is when you will start coming up with sounds. But before you reach that point, before you have finalized that this exact word is what I am going to speak, you come up with sort of an intermediate representation called the lemma. The lemma basically has information about both the word's meaning and its syntax. This is the word, this is broadly what this word means and this is the syntax or this is the way this word is particularly used. So you kind of go from uh, activating lexical concepts to doing lexical selection and from once you've done the lexical selection now you come with the come up with a lemma. Okay, this is roughly what I have decided to speak. Now I have a lemma in my hand. Lemma has already told me a little bit about uh, this word's meaning, what this word intends to convey and it also uh, told me a little bit about how this word should be used ideally, both things. Now once uh, there is uh, you know an activated set of lemmas, the process of activating the sound codes needs to begin. Okay? So as soon as you kind of figured out okay this is what I need to talk about, this is what I am going to talk about, then basically you will move on slowly to activating the sounds because you speak in sounds, you don't speak in ideas, isn't it? Unless you have sounds, you will not uh, be able to go further and produce those sounds. So you have to come up with, start coming up with, okay, these are the sounds, how do you do it? This process is called morphological encoding. What is morphological encoding? Uh, before uh, that, uh, let me tell you a little bit about what morphemes are. Morphemes are these basic units of language representation and morphological processing is kind of important because words appear in different forms depending upon the aspects of meaning versus depending upon you know the grammatical function of these words. If you remember I, pr I probably remember talking a little bit about morphemes in the earlier um, uh, you know chapters uh, but morpheme is say for example you have uh, to convey the meaning of kick. Now you can be talking about kick or he kicked or he is kicking or he usually kicks. Now the same word can appear in so many different versions, each of these different versions has a different syntactical grammatical function but also differs in meaning. So the knowledge that one of this has to be selected is basically your process of selecting a particular lemma. Depending on what you want to really speak, you will select one of these words as a, you know, as a candidate that okay, in this sentence I am going to talk about this person who is kicking this uh, animal at this point let us say. So I have to talk about the act of kick in continuous sense, so let me pick kicking. Okay? So let us say from this uh, process of uh, you know activating the lexical concept and to doing lexical selection you had the lemma of kick activated. You have to once you have to kind of you know uh, you've activated that lemma you have to figure out which version of the word kick you want to really talk about. So you say okay I want to communicate about the continuous version of this act happening, so let me pick up kicking. Okay, this process here is close to what is referred to as morphological encoding. Okay, during this morphological encoding, Level notes that for each word we have what is referred to as a morphological specification. What is a morphological specification? Again, it is basically this that I was describing right now. So it tells us that how a word will be behave uh, will be behaving. Uh, when it is placed in a particular sentence. So when I put kicking in a particular sentence, 
it implies that I am talking about an act which is going on at the moment. The morphological specification, say for example, for the word eat, an example that Traxler takes, includes that it is a root form and it is a past tense inflection and its past tense inflection is ate and its continuous inflection is eating. So all of this knowledge needs to come in. Also the form of the word, its morphological specification, exactly which version is going to be used changes depending upon what precise role the lemma is supposed to play in the sentence. So exactly what is your sentence going to be about? What is the idea that the sentence intends to convey? On the basis of all of that, you will pick up this exact idea, this exact morpheme. Now, having selected a set of morphemes to produce, okay, this is what I want to talk about, this is what I want to talk about, this is what I want to talk about. To produce morphological encoding, basically it starts activating the speech sounds, that is the phonemes that are needed to plan the articulatory movements. So as soon as you've kind of figured out, okay, I'm going to talk about kicking, there are two morphemes in here, kick and ing, you have to kind of create, start creating a preparation for the sound of k, e, k, and i, n, g, ing, and g, basically because you have to kind of have these more, uh, phonemes activated so that you can combine them and create the speech output. So the speech sound sounds one produces depends then on the morphemes that one has activated. So which, so have I activated kicked? So then the morphemes I would have activated will be kick and ed. Uh, versus if I have to produce kicking, then the morphemes that I would have activated will be kick and ing. So I have to kind of uh, select which of the morphemes that I have to activate. Okay, so obviously the speech sounds that will get activated will depend on these morphemes and also will have to be organized in the right sequence to ensure that the sounds are produced in the right order. So I cannot say for example say ing kick, I have to say kick ing. So in uh, other than the fact that both kick and ing are activated, I have to also make sure that kick comes out of my mouth first after ing. Okay, so this is also something that you really need to work about. Okay. So let us kind of do a little bit of a recap. Where have we come for now? We activated some particular lexical concepts. We did a little bit of lexical selection there. Then we came up to lemmas. After that, we kind of uh, went closer to look at the morphological specification of that lemma. So suppose the idea was, I wanted some version of the word kick. Now the morphological specification that I'm going to use is the continuous version. Okay, so I'm kind of now uh, sure that I have to produce the exact word kicking. So I have now, after this morphological specification, I have two morphemes, kick and ink. Once I have this, I know which are the sounds that are needed. Which are the phonemes that are needed is k, e, k, and uh, ing, and g. Okay, so we have to have this. So we've kind of moved from the concepts to the sounds here. Let us move further. Now, once you have, you know, the morphemes slotted into the right positions, what you can do is you can start activating the individual speech sounds, so k, e, k, and all of that. You have to start activating that from your memory. What we normally think of as a word is referred to as a lexeme. So when you talk about, say, for example, words, this is basically referred to as a lexeme. Lexeme is the shortest unit in your mental lexicon, so to speak. Okay. Uh, to produce the lexeme, to say these words, you have to obviously activate a set of phonemes. You know, k, e, k, all of those. Say, for example, if you were to do a phonetic transcription of this word, so you have to go to that, and also you have to organize them. So not only you have to have kick and ink coming one after each other. Even within the lexeme, you have to see that the phonemes follow each other. Say, when k, e, and k, so e has to come between the two k's. Okay. If ik, ik, ik comes, then this is not the correct thing. So you have to kind of organize within the lexeme as well, and between the two morphemes as well. Both kind, both levels of organi organization need to be there in order for you to be able to speak without making a lot of errors. Now you see how complicated sort of this is uh, when I, I just have to say one sentence, you know, uh, the man is kicking the dog or something like that, okay? Now, uh, is lexeme a real, so before we go further, is lexeme a real uh, thing? Is, is it a psychologically real concept? So some people had doubts about this. I'm not really uh, using a lot of references here. I'm just, I just want you to understand the concept. So basically to investigate whether uh, the lexeme is a psychologically real level of representation, uh, some of the evidence comes from studies involving the production of homophones. Now what are homophones? As the name suggests, homo basically means same, phones basically means the sound. So 
same sounding things okay now a homophone is a word that has more than one meaning same sounding does not mean having the same meaning so homophone is words that have the same sound but not necessarily the same meaning so homophone is a word that has more than one meaning that is a lexeme like but has two spellings b u t but and b u t t but you uh, you'll uh, appreciate the but is you know the back side of your uh, 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 you know body and but is this interjection that you know i want to do this but i cannot do this because of this reason something like so these are the two uh, versions that i'm talking about in english the beauty but that is the interjection occurs more frequently as compared to the but that is the body part okay but both sounds probably because you know both the sounds are very similar so according to these current production models that are uh, afloat both the versions but and but they will activate the same sets of sounds obviously okay because the lexeme represents how the word is pronounced and both the versions are pronounced in exactly the same way so even if uh, you know the meanings are different uh, the sounds that are going to be get activated are exactly the same now if this is exactly the case both lexemes should experience what is referred to as the frequency inheritance effect what is the frequency inheritance effect the frequency inheritance effect is basically that if a word has a high frequency twin uh, you should produce low frequency version about almost as fast as as the high frequency twin so the beauty but versus the beauty t but basically uh, one is much lower in frequency than the other beauty but is kind of spoken much much more but the idea is whenever say for example if you give somebody a sentence and this but has to be produced you will see that this but is produced almost as far fast as this but basically because the same set of sounds you have a lot of practice with producing so when you ask your system to talk about the but you will probably have a ready set of sounds activated and you can very quickly say this so this particular effect that I was just talking about is referred to as the frequency inheritance effect. Now, in a different scenario, conversely, if the word, um, word has two versions and both are low frequency, then basically what happens is it should take relatively longer time to respond to the word because both sounds you're not really very familiar with, both sounds uh, you don't really uh, have a lot of practice with saying. So flex and flex. So you can see the slide F L E C K S versus F L E X. Uh, both ways you will kind of take a little bit more time time to produce them. Now there are a lot of experiments that have been carried out in in, in this field, and some of the experiments involving picture naming, uh, they do provide evidence for frequency inheritance effect, and also do experiments that involve translation from one language to another. In both of these kinds of experiments what has generally been seen is that low frequency words were produced faster if they had a higher frequency twin one so this is the evidence for frequency inheritance effect other hand is that so the time it takes you to produce a word is not based solely on how you frequently that words meaning is used but how frequently the sound related to those words has been used okay so beauty but kind of gets an advantage of having a higher frequency twin even though it is not really a very high frequent word in naming you will probably not experience a lot of lag when you have to ask somebody to produce beauty but okay so this is again something that comes out of this now uh, when we speak uh, phonemes need to be organized into larger units so basically one of the things that i want to talk to you about also as a part of this is that how are we organizing these sounds we're not organizing these sounds only at a phonemic level because that's a very micro level okay usually what we do is we organize them into slightly larger chunks and these larger chunks are referred to as syllables let's talk a little bit about that so we organize phonemes into these larger chunks called syllables producing each syllable requires a coordinated set of action and each set of action then needs to be performed because this whole concept of order k e and k uh, coming one after the other in that exact same order for you to be able to produce this exact same sound uh, you have to take some uh, action so before we speak we need to figure out how to map these activated set of sounds slash phonemes onto a set of syllables how do we take this slightly more amorphous organization to a more organized way that is syllables this process of organizing this activated set of phonemes into syllables is called syllabification uh, another concept that you'll probably need to remember 
Now, syllabification, let us talk a little bit about syllabification. Syllabification involves two subcomponent processes. First, activating a metrical structure in, and inserting individual speech sounds into positions in that metrical structure. What is metrical structure? If you remember, I was talking to you about this development in the last uh, week. We were talking about infant directed speech and children being uh, sensitive to stress patterns and so. Uh, there is this in in English for that ma for that matter I can talk to you about is a lot of the words 90 percent 85 90 percent of the words are trochaic words trochaic words are where the uh, stress is mostly on the first syllable rather than on the second syllable so for for example baby bottle the first syllable is stress the second syllable is slight of weaker strong weak strong weak okay now this metrical structure basically is this arrangement of sound units you know syllable size units in addition to specifying the number of syllables that you need you also need to specify the uh, stress basically how much stress is going to be put on where you know on which part of the syllable so the metrical structure basically uh, needs to be activated how it will be activated you will uh, basically arrange these sounds into a particular way that okay this is the first syllable this is the second syllable this is the third syllable you also need to basically say this syllable will be stressed this will be unstressed something like that Okay, if you are talking about bisyllabic words or say for example if you use the trisyllabic words, uh, say for example per nama, uh, then you have to say which syllable is stressed, which is not stressed. Okay, And the system needs to know that because that is how it will be able to produce that. Remember we are not talking about writing, we are talking about producing and we are producing uh, words, we need to really know which part of what we have to produce should be stressed or which part should not be stressed. So we have to be really careful about this. Let us take an example to understand this better. Suppose I have to talk about the banana. Okay, so banana has how many sounds? Ba, na, and na. Basically, two sounds. Uh, one is the repetition. So we have ba, na, na. Uh, the word banana uh, basically has which is the stress. So just look at this. Uh, banana. So na basically the second syllable is the one that is stressed, and uh, the third and the first are slightly less stressed. Okay. Uh, whereas Panama, basically the first syllable is stressed and the second and the third syllables are not stressed. So the first thing that I really need you to pick up is that you see that the two words composed of very similar syllables basically are differing in stress patterns. Now how suppose say for example you have a denotation for each syllable, you should also have a denotation for stress on each syllable. So basically again something that I have kind of borrowed a little bit from Traxler is you can look at this. So banana if you see that you know the symbol here is uh, uh, is representing the syllable the dash mark is representing the stress so you see for banana the stress is on the second syllable whereas in panama the stress is on the first syllable okay this is how you kind of you know uh, basically so you had morphemes and you had the uh, you know uh, sounds that needed to be produced but before you can kind of produce the sounds you needed to organize them into syllables and not only in just organize them into syllable size units, you, know, you also needed to specify which part of these syllables will be stressed and which will not. So both of these things you really need to be careful about. So yeah, here each uh, uh, sigma symbol uh, uh, stands for a syllable and the dash mark indicates which syllable in the string would basically be accented or stressed. Once the metrical structure has been laid down, individual phonemes can be inserted into this metrical structure that makes up your syllable. This is basically your syllabification. Now again, a question can be asked, is syllabification really happening? Is this a psychologically real stage of processing? Uh, yes, you can ask this. And then what we will need to do is we will need to look at how people produce words. So let us take an example. Consider the word escorting. Escorting, it has two morphemes, escort and ing. So escort and ing. Uh, when people uh, actually speak escorting, they produce it in three segments, as I just said, escorting, so s, cor, and ting, okay. That means the syllabification process in the production uh, have placed the t phoneme together with the uh, ing morpheme, okay. So basically you have s, cor, and ting, okay, uh, rather than with the root morpheme escort. Basically what has happened is we have not really gone with the morphological organization while speaking, we have gone with the syllable organization. So we have said S, Cor and Ting, these are the three syllables. The morphemes may be different, the morphemes are only to escort and ing, but there are three syllables here, S, Cor and Ting and this is what you need to follow because you are speaking this out. 
okay. So, this is something that I would obviously uh, you know like you to remember. Now, so we, dim uh, so we simply if you again look back at what we have been talking about, we simply do not need to just activate morphemes, uh, we also activate the phonemes uh, that go and uh, do not really simply again just uh, saying this again. So, we do not simply need to activate morphemes and then activate the phonemes that will go with each of the morphemes and produce them in sequence, we have to do a little bit more. What we need to do is after the morphemes are activated, we calculate the best way of organizing these phonemes into particular syllables and it is these syllables which are going to be serving as the template for production. We are not speaking by morphemes, we actually are speaking by uh, these syllables. So, you activate morphemes, then you kind of uh, activate the individual sounds and then you act organize the individual sounds into syllables and then you basically use the syllables as template for production, that is basically what is happening here. Now, even when the process responsible for calculating syllables sometimes would lump together different words, for example, in the case of he will escort us, you will have escort and tus, you know, people would usually say something like this, even though the morphemes are only to escort and us. So, while we need uh, morphemes and words to plan what to say, speech does not really simply involve activating the sweet sounds in individual words. Instead, the speech planning system basically activates a set of morphemes and words at once and then figures out the best way to organize the morphemes and words into a set of syllables and that set of syllables is what we are going to say, okay. Sometimes the syllables would uh, uh, kind of uh, respect the morphemic boundaries, sometimes they will not. But for us, at least as far as production is concerned, the organizing principle will be these syllables. Again, uh, just to make a caveat here, we are basically talking about English production. You know, I am sure this could differ for different languages. The rules are different, the syllabification process is different, the way of organizing and chunking the sounds is obviously different. But again, because we are talking about English, we have more data and more theory about that, that is clear. So, that is why in this course, mostly uh, everything that I am going to talk about is pertaining to English. Now, in Leveled and Wielden's words, they say the speakers do not concatenate citation form of words, but rhythmic pronunciable metrical structures that most often than not ignore word boundaries. You know, people say for example, you can see that this happens with individual speakers as well. Different speakers will kind of chunk the, uh, you know, uh, uh, the sound that they have to say, the sentence in different ways. People from uh, speaking different languages do that all the time. So, we have to kind of uh, be mindful of that what is the organizing principle here. Now, once all of this is done, once the syllabification process is done, what do you have? You have a set of phonological words. What are phonological words? Uh, in the Weaver++ model, a phonological word is a set of syllables that needs to be produced as a single unit. So, while escort and us are two different legacy, are two different lemmas uh, and two different words, uh, when they are actually spoken, they come out as uh, two uh, simple phonological words, whereas escortus, so basically, uh, you know, escortus kind of comes across as one word almost, okay. So, according to the Weaver++ model, you can begin to speak as soon as you have activated all of the syllables that need to be said, so escort and tus, three syllables need to be activated for you to be able to speak, he will escort us, okay. Also, while you are planning each utterance by activating a number of these lemmas and morphemes simultaneously, you also have to plan the actual speech movements, so articulation, one phonological word at a time. You can plan the entire sentence, but your articulator basically will need to plan one word or one unit at a time, because that is how these muscles will work, otherwise they will all get kind of mixed up. So, you plan the movements you need to produce for each phonological word, one syllable at a time. Again, that is important in a left to right scenario. What were we talking about? Morphemes, phonemes, phonemes into syllables. Now, you have the syllables, but you also have to kind of ensure that the order in which these syllables have to come out. So, you have to not only kind of, uh, you know, come up with one phonological word at a time, but you also have to ensure that each phonological word is said in exactly that same order. Otherwise, you will be saying, so, S, uh, you know, a scortes or something like that that you also have to remember. So, this has to happen in a sort of a left to right fashion, so to speak, you know, taking the analogy from script. Yeah, so before you activate the phonemes or the syllables, you will you'll need uh, these things later on, you have to kind of ensure the order. 
is this ordering really necessary? Do we actually do this ordering? Again, a question might come up, uh, but people have kind of tested for this using something called the phoneme monitoring task. What is the phoneme monitoring task? In some of the picture naming experiments, you know, people are given uh, pictures and they have to name those pictures. In some of these picture naming experiments, people have been tested on what is referred to as phoneme monitoring. Basically, what happens is that in these experiments, people look at a picture and they try to say a word that describes these pictures as quickly as possible. So, I can be shown pictures of apple, banana, uh, grape, something like that. I have to kind of speak these things. In a secondary task, while you are naming this or while I am naming this, uh, you would also be given a target phoneme uh, and you would be asked to uh, press a button as quickly as possible if the target phoneme occurred in the picture's name. So, as soon as B comes, you have to press the button. So, I am saying apple, banana, as soon as B comes, I press the button. Okay. So, if you are asked to name the picture of a rabbit and the target phonemes are R and B, and you should press a button as quickly as, and I have been telling you that you should press a button as quickly as possible, you should refrain from responding if the target phoneme is, you know, target phoneme to monitor is K. So, I am giving you these words, the target phoneme is K, uh, you go with R, B, and T, rabbit, uh, you do not press it. Okay. Now, this target phoneme, uh, people can do this phoneme monitoring task very accurately. They are very good at tracking what sounds they are producing, that is all right. But they respond a little bit faster if the target phoneme is from the beginning of the phonological word as compared to if the target phoneme comes from the end of the phonological word. What does this tell you? It tells us that people are kind of producing this also in a left to right sort of a serial kind of a fashion. Okay. Now, uh, we started from conceptualization, we started, uh, we went from lexical selection, we came out with a lemma, we uh, went to morphological specification, we came out with a particular set of morpheme. Uh, once we had a final morpheme, you kind of uh, activated phonemes that are single sounds. Once you had activated those phonemes, you put them into syllables, you uh, specified the metrical structure. Once you did all of that, you came up with a phonological word. Once you did all of that, you kind of ensured the ordering into which how this is going to be spoken. Once you have this, then how do you move further? Okay. Then you come up with, okay, this is what has to be said. Now, let us look at, look back again and try and summarize this. So, how does Weaver++ work? 1. Production begins with a set of ideas that the speaker wishes to express. Second, in the next step, those ideas are tied to lexical concepts because the language may have specific words for those ideas or may not. So, then you will need lexicalization. After a set of lexical concepts has been activated, lemmas that correspond to those lexical concepts become activated. So, kick. So, if that if there is a lemma uh, associated with kick, that becomes activated. It tells you, okay, this uh, uh, meaning or this uh, version has to be used. Activating lemmas provides information about the morphological properties of the word. So, you kind of uh, need to know, okay, uh, because I am going to talk about the continuous version of the word kick, I need to have kicking. So, I need to have both of these, uh, you know, uh, uh, forms activated. So, activating lemmas provides uh, um, information about the morphological properties of the words, including information about how words can be combined. Now, after a set of morphemes has been activated and organized into a sequence, the speech sounds uh, that are required to be, uh, that are required will then be activated. After you kind of know which speech sounds have to be activated, you go to the phonological encoding part, which involves the activation of metrical structures and syllabification. Then you, uh, the outcome of this process is a set of phonological words, uh, basically consisting of a sequence of syllable sized frames. So, that is what you have. After this, you move to what is called phonetic encoding. So, during phonetic encoding, the speech production system consults a set of stored representations of specific syllables. How is this syllable uh, going to be pronounced? The system then activates the appropriate syllable representations and places them in appropriate positions in the frame. Okay. So, I have to say, you know, kicking or escorters or whatever. I have to kind of say how exactly I am going to produce this. What is the exact phonetic sound makeup? This representation basically uh, is now, uh, is basically then going to be used by the motor system to create what is referred to as a phonetic gestural score. And this phonetic gestural score is the representation that is going to be used by the motor system to plan the actual muscle movement. So, S, so there is a particular configuration of my muscles that will produce S, then core, then tus. 
So I have to kind of you know create this program so that I exactly say escorters and not something else. Okay. So this is this is pretty much till the phonetic gestural score part. Uh, again, I'm looking at the model. Uh, final thing that you have to do is finally say this: move the uh, muscles in exactly that same order. That is what articulation is all about. Once you said something, you again hear it back. That kind of is the start of your feedback loop. Part of what happens there, we'll come to in one of the other lectures. So I hope I discussed the levels model in some detail. I'm sure this was a lot of information to handle in, in one go. So I would say, for example, you look at each stage, draw your own diagram and maybe go back and forth a few number of times in order to understand this but keep this model uh, side uh, you know besides you in a handy way so that when i'm when you're hearing me describe each of these steps you can kind of mark okay this is what where this is exactly happening in this sequential serial sort of a model okay that's all for this lecture i'll talk to you about a different process uh, in the next class thank you